Sarah tells the social worker the same story she told Mrs. Taylor. She explained that she's very confused and she just doesn't know what's true and what's not and she's scared. The social workers leave the room, they have a side conversation and then they come back in. They tell Sarah, all right, we're gonna take you home now. Sarah, unsure of what the hell just happened, she follows the social workers to the parking lot for them to take her home. Because they told her that they're gonna take her home now, she didn't feel the urge or the need to call her parents anymore. Keep in mind, Sarah lived pretty close to the damn school, okay, walking distance. So she didn't really necessarily need a drive, but she decided she was very exhausted and tired and so she's going to get in their car and they're gonna bring her home anyway. When Sarah got in the car of the social workers, they suggested to her that she must be hungry. She must be starving. You know, it's been a long day. She was supposed to be home already. She must be extremely hungry. They asked her if she wanted to stop at the Wendy's before they dropped her off home. Since it was on the way, and I mean, who is gonna resist a spicy chicken combo? Come on, number six. Who's gonna resist that? Nobody. So, of course, she's like, I could eat, shoot. <laughs> I love me some Wendy's. So, she says, yeah, she would love to eat. The social workers take her to the Wendy's drive-thru, they get her food, they park the car, pass her her food, and they start eating their food. So Sarah says to the social workers, um, it's getting kind of late, like, I think my parents will probably be worried about me, so maybe we should get me home. Again, the CPS workers tell her that her parents are aware that she's with them, it's totally fine, you know, just eat your food, we'll get you home soon. One of them even makes a joke and says, better us than the guy in the cloak, right? Sarah did not find this funny at all, okay? Sarah was like, why would, why would they say that? That's not a funny joke. Like I just told them I'm having these traumatic dreams, nightmares, and they're telling me it's better that they have me than the guy in the cloak. Like what does that even mean? Sarah got extremely quiet and decided she needs to escape. She needs to get the hell up out of this car. But when she looks around, she realizes that the back of the car ain't no doorknobs on the inside and it's locked like a police car. Damn! Sarah's heart is beating in her chest. She's like boom, 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 boom. Like her heart is racing a mile a minute and she is like panicking on the inside, freaking out, having an attack on the inside, but obviously she can't show it on her face on the outside. Sarah's mouth was dry, but she lost her appetite so she couldn't eat and she decides because her mouth is dry, she's gonna have a sip of her drink. Sarah didn't know it, but her drink was laced and she fell into a deep, deep slumber. So boom, it's getting late and her parents are in a freaking panic, okay? They're like, where is our child? They don't understand why it's after 7 p.m. and their daughter has not returned home. She's not called, nothing. It's Silent. Sarah's mom and dad decide they're gonna call Sarah's friends and see if she's at any of their houses, or if they've seen her, anything like that. Sarah's best friend, Stassi, ends up telling her parents she was kept after school today and she was talking to some people in the classroom. Her parents, confused, call the police, but because it hasn't been 24 hours, they can't do nothing for them. So her parents are pissed. Sarah's parents get in their car and they start driving around looking for their daughter. The next day, they show up at the school before the bell even rings and they are up in that office ready to go, okay? They immediately demand to speak to the principal. Mrs. Taylor rushes into the office and she tries to explain to Sarah's parents what happened the day before. She also tells them she was under the impression that they knew that those social workers were going to be talking to their daughter. Mrs. Taylor tries her best to explain to her parents that it's not her doing, it's not her fault, and we really need to be pointing eyes at Miss Randall. At this point, Sarah's daddy is tearing the office up, okay? It's paper flying everywhere. The glass from the, the, the office door is smashed. The Front desk is tore up. There is a phone flying across the room. It's a mess in there, okay? Sarah's mom, she didn't even try to calm her husband down because she was equally as livid. She was just reacting internally. So the principal says, you know what? This must be a misunderstanding. I'm going to call the CPS 
office and find out who was here yesterday and you know what happened because they were supposed to drive Sarah home. When the principal got on the phone with the social worker office or the CPS office, she says, you know, these two agents were here, their names are this and that, and I'm looking for them because this is the situation, blah, 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 blah. The receptionist on the other side of the phone says, there is nobody that works here by those names. So are you sure that, you know, that, that those are the names? She's like, I'm absolutely sure I have it written down. Those are the names. And the lady on the other side of the phone said, well, I, I don't know what to tell you, but those people don't work here. <laughs> you, you could try to the office, but they ain't here. At, they ain't in this database, okay? Principal looked like she just saw a freaking ghost. She is stark white, okay? Which don't make no type of sense, cause it's a black lady. <laughs> She's a black lady and she is stark white. Make it make sense. The principal says to the lady on the phone, there has to be some mistake, please check again. At this point, the receptionist is like, listen lady, I already told you, ain't nobody here by that name. I have to go, sorry. Okay, so since there's no Colleen Jeffers or Pat McCroy, the principal has to tell Sarah's parents who are sat in her office fuming that we don't know where your daughter is, those people do not exist, and I, 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 don't, know what to, I, I don't know what else to tell you. The principal had to tell Sarah's parents that their daughter left the school with two people posing as social workers. Sarah's mom is completely distraught, okay? She is losing her mind in there. She is speaking in tongues, calling out to God. Like, she's like, uh-uh, where's my child? Find my child. Oh Lord, we need to find her now. So Sarah's dad, who already tore up the reception part of the office, now he is in the principal's face and he's like, listen, I don't know how y'all let this happen, but y'all need to figure it out ASAP, okay? ASAP. Find my child. Mrs. Taylor leaves in a hurry to go and get Mrs. Randall. She drags her into the office and she tells her she has obviously got some explaining to do. Mrs. Randall starts telling the principal and Sarah's parents there must be some kind of mix up. It's fine though, I'm sure we could just call the office and you know, find out about the two workers that were here. The principal explains to Mrs. Randall, we already called and they said, those people do not exist. And if they do exist, they don't work here. Mrs. Taylor, in the height of all this confusion, asks the principal a very important question. Mrs. Taylor turns to the principal and she says, who made the call yesterday to get the social workers in? You or Mrs. Randall? The principal starts stuttering. She's like, well, 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 I was about to call, but I was preoccupied. So Mrs. Randall insisted that she call as to not disrupt my workflow. The room is dead silent, okay? Dead silent. You could hear a pin drop. Sarah's mama pulls out her Motorola Razor, okay? She calls 911 right away. Sarah's dad approaches Miss Randall, but before he could get too close, Miss Randall pulls out her gun. She starts waving that thing around the room. She's like, who wants some of this? Y'all better back up off me. So she tells Sarah's mom, you better hang up that little crusty old phone you got because ain't nobody calling the police today. Hang it up right now. Terrified, of course, she obliges. There's one gun in the room and four people and a woman that is unhinged holding the weapon. Miss Randall was privy to the information that the school keeps a few thousand dollars in the safe in the office. And so she tells the principal to open the safe and give her the money. Miss Randall throws her toe and tells the principal, you need to fill the bag. And so of course, shaking, she gets on her knees, she undoes the, the lock on the safe and she starts filling the tote. Now Miss Randall, she has her gun pointed at and she's just doing this whole thing. And she tells the principal she needs to hurry the hell up. So the principal throws Miss Randall her tote. She picks it up while still pointing the gun and keeping eye contact to make sure nobody's gonna try to disarm her. And she backs out the room and takes off. Once Miss Randall leaves the office, they call the police like, okay, this is just turned into a whole other saga. Like they call the police and they're like, 
it's not a missing person, it's a kidnapping. We gotta do something about this. Mrs. Taylor is in the office trying to console Sarah's mom. By the time the police arrived and took statements, Mrs. Randall was long gone, okay? The principal and Mrs. Taylor both gave their best descriptions of Mrs. Randall, the two social workers that were there, and of course they gave a description of and provided a picture of Sarah to the police so that they could start their search. Now, when Sarah woke up, she was mad, confused, and she was very groggy, because remember, her drink was laced. It wasn't like when she normally woke up and was confused though, and could still function, at least a little bit, it was a completely different kind of confusion. This time around, she woke up unsure of what day it was, what time it was, where she was, and how long she'd even be, been asleep for. Sarah laid there in silence for a minute, but then when she looked around and she didn't see anything familiar, like her dresser or her room door, she figured she must still be dreaming and she shut her eyes and try to fall back asleep in her dream, only she wasn't dreaming. She was very much awake and was just unsure of where the hell she was. When Sarah comes to the realization that this is not a dream, she sits up in the bed, but her ankles are chained. Sarah begins screaming for her mom and dad, okay? She is screaming. The two social workers and Mrs. Randall, they all run into the room and tell her to shut the hell up. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. Sarah is bawling her eyes out. She's like, <laughs> all that. She's like begging and pleading with them. She very bravely tells them, look, my parents are rich. Like they'll give you anything you want, all that stuff, okay? Mrs. Randall is very intrigued. She's like, how rich are we talking, girl? So Sarah tells Mrs. Randall, I don't know what my dad does for a living. I just know that whatever he buys for himself, he buys my mama one too. And every Christmas, he always buys her a new car. Mrs. Randall and her two accomplices, they go and speak in private. They decided that there might have to be a change of plans because they didn't know this information when they decided to take Sarah. The original plan for taking Sarah was to harvest her kidney only because Mrs. Randall was dying and needed a kidney transplant really, really bad. At this point, they figured, it might be a better idea to just collect this ransom. I could buy a kidney if I got some ransom. <laughs> How they would get the money was another issue. The police show up to the address that Mrs. Randall had on file at the school. To their surprise, it was two old Caucasian people that had been living there since the damn 80s, okay? Miss Randall didn't live there. She gave them a bogus address, okay? And as it turned out, Mrs. Randall's name was not Mrs. Randall. She had transferred in from a school in Canada, so nobody really knew much about her. Mrs. Randall ends up throwing Sarah a burner phone and tells her to call her daddy. Shaking, she obliged. Obviously, Sarah's parents are waiting by the phone to hear from anybody, whether it's the police, the FBI, the news station, whoever, they were waiting by that phone. And when it rang, they for sure did not miss that call. Sarah gets on the phone with her dad and she tells him as calmly as possible that she is okay, but she's gonna need $50,000 cash, okay? And if she doesn't provide the $50,000, she's gonna be without a kidney and left for dead. Mrs. Randall grabs the phone from Sarah and smashes it. She breaks the phone, it is a burner phone, so she wants to keep the call short and sweet, otherwise they're gonna get traced. She ends up giving Sarah another burner phone. Sarah calls her dad back, but this time Mrs. Randall takes the phone and gives her dad some very clear instructions. She says, I need the cash, no police, and this is where you need to go with the money. Her father, of course, obliged and had to go to five different banks to withdraw $10,000 from each bank as to not raise any suspicion. Once he collected all the funds, he put it in a duffel bag, just as she instructed him, and took the bag to the Denny's that she told him to go to. He waited for further instruction. Sarah's dad was told to be at that Denny's for 3 p.m. on the dot, so, he was there at 3 p.m. and he would met a man in a red jacket at a table and gave him the money. At that time, Sarah's dad thought that the man in the red jacket looked really familiar, but he couldn't quite put his finger on where he'd seen him before. At this point, Sarah's dad 
gets a phone call and it's Sarah. She tells her dad, daddy, I don't know where I am, but I'm alone, they left, they're not here anymore. Sarah is crying profusely, okay? So Sarah's dad tells her, baby girl, I'm racing to the police station so they could trace this call, we could find you. And he's doing like a buck 50 <laughs> on the main road, sir, the speed limit is 50. He's doing a buck 50 on the main road, does, does not care, he's flying through red lights and everything, okay? He's like, I need to get my child. So he gets to the station, they set it up, they trace the call, and it pings off of a cell tower close to Sarah's school. At this point, it's blue and red lights everywhere. What's going on? Y'all are going to jail! They are flashing, wee wee, it's giving Bobby Valentino and Lil Wayne, okay? <laughs> it's giving a drug bust, but that's not what's going on. So there's red and blue lights flashing everywhere, okay? They pull up to the school and there's SWAT team, big guns, riot gear, shields, all kinds of stuff. And they go into the school. At this point, school has been, been done for the day. They go in the school and they're looking around and they have their flashlights and everything. And they locate Sarah in the basement of the school. Still chained to the bed. The police end up taking Sarah to the hospital for a wellness check. And of course her parents are by her side this entire time. It turned out that the dreams that she was having were like God warning Sarah. So she was kind of having like a premonition about what was going to happen to her, but in the end that she would be fine. And also, ultimately that her parents were not in on it. Mrs. Randall and her accomplices, they took the $50,000 and they ran off and they were never seen again. I guess off to the next town to either find a new kidney girl or live la vida loca, but I mean, four people split in $50,000 is not it, okay? <laughs> it's not it. And if you're wondering why the man at the Denny's look so damn familiar to Sarah's dad, it's because he was the janitor at the school. He skipped town too, child. He left town without a trace. They could not find him, could not locate him. Still, to this day, he is missing, okay? Now, Sarah, she went on to live a somewhat normal life, but of course, she struggled with trust issues way into her adulthood. She grew up to become a teacher with one goal in mind, which was to properly protect students. And as for Miss Taylor, she felt so guilty for so long about what happened to Sarah, but she did remain in contact with Sarah's family and Sarah. She actually ended up becoming the godmother to Sarah's children. Well, that is it for this spooky series. Tell me if you guys liked it, didn't like it. What do you think? Now, Anna is out. I love you all so much and I'll definitely see you in the next one.